Okay, um, right. Uh, so this week, um, we are working through chapter 15 of the book Outstanding User Interfaces with Shiny. Uh, Trevin Flickinger is going to take us through the content of the chapter. And we are, yeah, we're working through this book as part of a book club on the R for Data Science Slack community. Um, yeah, so over to you, Trevin, if you'd like to take us through this. Thanks, Russ. Um, hopefully, hopefully you all had a chance to um, take a look at this chapter and, and read through it a bit and see some of the examples. Um, yeah, I, I was able to go through it a couple of times, but uh, um, some of it was was a bit difficult for me. Um, so hopefully uh, where I lack understanding, you all can help uh, fill in the gaps a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and share my notes. Um, I've not, I put in a PR uh, push uh, for this to the, um, to GitHub, but I don't think it's been accepted yet. Um, so we'll just, yeah, we'll go through and uh, go through this. Um, so chapter 15, uh, optimize your apps with custom handlers. Uh, I did like the way that this was presented and written out. It kind of walks through uh, some of the options with Shiny, um, goes over some of the limitations with that. Not everything is available through Shiny. You can't, um, there's limited amount of uh, handlers, I guess, through Shiny and the various R packages. Um, so it goes through uh, what you can do with that. Another example with um, something a little more custom and then goes through and, and shows how you can leverage um, some JavaScript tools to highly optimize your, uh, your applications. Uh, so our learning objective uh, will leverage uh, shiny JavaScript tools to build uh, highly interactive and optimized interfaces. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of functions that can update the UI from the server. Um, the one or there's there's a couple different types of functions. We have uh, update functions, which can update uh, text or update um, update tabs as well. Uh, we have we also have toggle functions with within Shiny um, that can hide or show tabs, um, and then we get into uh, some of the render and, and insert or remove UI functions, which are a little more uh, customizable. Um, also feel free to uh, to stop me at any point with uh, uh, questions or if you have additional comments, uh, feel free to feel free to chime in. Um, let's see. I, yeah, I think there was more to this. Um, yeah, uh, insert UI and remove UI allows users to dynamically insert or remove any element anywhere in the DOM. Um, so uh, the book mentions that um, these other ones may be more limited, uh, a few number of them, and limits where you can insert um and then these other these other functions give you a little more flexibility uh so 
the way the book's structured, it will start off with like the less optimized approach uh, with render UI uh, to show uh, some of its caveats and then introduce some, some better approaches. Okay. Yeah, so I do like how uh, the author builds, like, builds the case for, um, for this setup. Uh, the render UI case, um, uh, it's the render UI and UI output most famous way to render any HTML block from the server, um, and then the update. Uh, the author says update name, any name function and toggle tools. Uh, their component specific only target the element to modify. Uh, but the caveat here uh, for render UI, uh, it re-renders the block each time. Uh, so that means uh, some poor performance in complex apps. Can go over here and uh, take a look at the take a look at the code. Um, let me. Oh, let me. Oh no! Can I do? Can I do code and and this at the same time? Let's. Let's see. Okay, so here we have um, here we have like a simple app um, with uh, with a three second pause with the system dot sleep, and that's. Um, that's I think carried over through the the render UI function. Uh, so if we run this, that's where the that's where the pause comes in. It it pauses before uh, the the slider and, and toggle is actually rendered. Um, so let me go back not to that, but to this. Okay, so so that's our uh if if we um do the same example with uh an update function, um I think the difference here is So we have we have an update function inside uh, an observe event, uh, and if we run this instead, we won't have that same hang up of the display. Oh. What was that? And so it uh, it'll display um, the slider, but I think there's still a pause where um, the value is, is there's a hang up in the value. So after after three seconds, it should shift back to 150. Is 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 that right? Or um, is that that seemed to be my how the code was. Oh no! Ooh, oh god! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's not. It's not good. Uh, uh, see live. Um. Let's see. Uh, so it's a pause and then goes to three fifty. Um. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Maybe I'm sorry. Maybe I'm mistaken there. And it, yeah, yeah, it's not it's, after. So it's like just at the initiation, initiation okay. of the app that it, it sets 
a value of 150. I thought it was kind of written so that it would, like, whenever the users changed their choice, it would zip back to a default after a while. But it was my mistake. Sorry. No, I, I that's a that's a good uh, observation. I wasn't sure either, uh, to be honest. Um, hopefully. Hopefully that R, oh, I might need to terminate R. Oops. <laughs> yeah, can, can I ask a uh, question? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, what, uh, okay, this is just um, uh, list. Huh? Okay, uh, basically, pause the code. For for the one that you mentioned that you uh, said, what invalidate later uh, will do instead? Invalidate later. In in then, here. Um, I put in the chat uh, the, the function invalidate later because I just I was searching for those things, and um, I found yeah. that there is uh, this function invalidate later as well. So which one of the two is the most uh, suitable one? If I want to pause, uh, like put a, um, so let's imagine I've got a function that takes a while to, no, yeah, uh, or a function or maybe um, um, uh, some calculation that takes a bit. And if you run all, all together, it might slip. Uh, so it doesn't, doesn't um, so it, it requires before to, 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 to jump to the next uh, calculation, uh, a bit of uh, rest. So like uh, freezing the system a uh, few uh, seconds, give the time to uh, computing um, the calculation and then pass to the next. Uh, uh, the, to the next one, and uh, I'm searching for, for those things. I, I found this invalidate later, and then as well as this list. So which one is the best to use? And uh, um... um, let's see. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Uh, Sys sleep might be what you want um, if it's not tied to um, a reactive context. Um, that's my initial thought. I'm not. I'm not sure if anyone else has other uh, considerations on the on those differences. My understanding was that. Invalidate later if if you had invalidate later with, with an argument of four thousand in a inside a reactive or or something it it would mean that every four seconds that reactive would be re evaluated is that not correct whereas cis sleep would um would pause during the evaluation of a um of, of some reactive it wouldn't necessarily force that reactive to get reevaluated at, at a later time point maybe i've misunderstood but um in invalidate later is like a way of um getting your code to run on a periodic basis i, I think um uh, so 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 the purpose of uh pausing the uh uh, uh, uh the calculations so the, the the app running all the code in one go so within two uh calculations this slip is the most suitable one is that right well i i don't think i mean you wouldn't really use this sleep in re re real code though would you because all, all it will do is hold up the r session 
whereas in validate later there might be a, a valid reason why you'd want to rerun some code after a a, a, a period uh, sys sleep is used in a lot of these examples just to kind of illustrate what would happen if there was a long running process going on that's taking up the computational um effort of the server um okay yeah. um yeah so let's say that i've got uh this this uh calculation which takes like um four to five seconds or something like that to compile and then the result of this calculation we go inside another calculation and so if i don't give the enough time to do the first calculation the second one would work properly or at least this one well the second one won't be able to do anything until the first one's evaluated anyway so um yeah i, do, I don't think either invalidate later or um to sleep would, would would be appropriate in your code to i don't know um what would you do what could be an example of when you i don't i don't really know the know, best answer have, I'm if happy. i compile the code that then it doesn't find the, the result which should be able to find it just run well, anyway, just a just, uh, quick, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, concern about those things that I can put inside the app, for so pausing a bit, letting the app yeah. running the code, and then setting back. So that, that, that's what I thought I was the most useful uh, way to use this thing. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure if I have a good answer for that. Um, um, yeah, so that, that was showing just some, uh, computationally intensive task uh as as kind of uh a way to show that pause um so the the i guess the first approach um uh discourages end users because uh you don't you don't see the tool right away um the second approach is much better um even though they may be tempted to play the, with the slider uh, until it suddenly changes value um and then we have a uh, an example with uh render ui um uh, it's a very naive and dirty example, makes an entire dropdown menu re-render each time something changes in the render UI expression, uh, which is not optimal. Um, I don't know very much about React, but React users would probably leap off their chairs if they ever heard about this. Uh, in React, we only re-render what needs to be updated. Okay, uh, I might just go ahead and run the example from the package. Um, so here uh, we have uh, some messages. We can add add a message uh so paul gets paul gets added another one from paul
And I think I'm guessing since it re-renders every time, that's why it um, collapses after every, if it's open. Yeah. Um, so if I click this, it'll collapse and then add a new message. Um, so it's just the it's just the drop down that's getting rendered again, isn't it? it, it no other part of the page, you know, because the the drop down there is kind of nested inside the rest of the app, and it's only the the drop down that's getting updated by render UI. There's no changes happening to the the page within which it's embedded to to my knowledge when you use render ui but everything below in the html tree will get updated so it's like render ui is updating the entirety of the html tree below that um element that it, it, it's targeted against isn't it or something That makes sense. Um, so it's re-rendering, it's re-rendering the entire HTML within the dropdown. Yeah. Um okay. So I'm guessing it doesn't seem uh it doesn't seem to uh too slow or or maybe um maybe as a as an example gets more complex it would it would show versus um something more targeted i guess mm. if if i'm understanding this correctly yeah yeah um but yeah i, I am a, a bit surprised at uh it's supposed to be an example for uh slowness but it's not necessarily too too yeah. bad um, let's see here will this uh will this let me still use this okay oh uh, they uh also show the this looks like all the HTML within, um, within that dropdown. Is that right, Russ? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so. So you should, I mean, you should be able to see that if you inspect the page that you, when you've got that app running, but yeah. I'm not sure. Um, is this different in Firefox at all? Uh, uh, it shouldn't look any different, I don't think. Web, um, well, web developer yeah. tools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you um, maybe if you like right click on one of those messages and go to inspect at the bottom okay yeah so there is a list of drop down items isn't there um if you go up a, a few steps from where you are um over this way or uh sorry no um if you look at the top of the inspector panel at the moment, there's a class equals drop down item. Um, okay. Yeah, where your where your pointer is at the moment, and there'll be a few of them all within the, within a list or something like that 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 defines these the different. Oh no, they won't be within a list, but yeah, there'll there'll be a stack of those drop down items within like next to each other in the HTML. Okay. Um, and that then that's what gets added to the 
the list, so to say. Mm, yeah, yeah. When you when you're clicking add message, you'll end up with an extra one in there. But it might <laughs> the re-rendering of the UI might mean that oh, yeah. you you lose where you were in the the um anyway. Oh yeah, there the it is. Okay. okay, cool. Thank you. Um let's see. So we'll go, yeah, we'll go, we'll take a look at some of the other shiny handlers and then uh take a look at the custom handlers i'm not sure if we'll get through uh there was a beastly example at the end of uh mm -hmm. of a chat app i'm not sure if if you, you all got to check it out or not but it was uh it, it felt like um going from like zero to 100 uh very quickly on on the example <laughs> uh so yeah we'll we'll keep going uh uh, other shiny handlers. Um, so insert UI case. Uh, insert UI sends an R message through session. Uh, send insert UI via the WebSocket. Um, content is processed by shiny process steps. Um, finds and resolves any HTML dependency. Uh, for each dependency, make sure the corresponding files can be assessed on the server uh, with create web dependency and add resource path. Um, returns a list of HTML element and dependencies. Uh, the HTML will be assessed by uh, message content HTML and dependencies by message content dot depths. Um, go back. Excuse me, we'll go back to the book here. Um, so this is uh, this is under the hood. Uh, insert UI sends an R message through uh, through the session via WebSocket. Um, I think this is R. I think this is R six. If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, let's see, something I need to get more comfortable with. Uh, uh, I strongly discourage using shiny process steps or any other internal function since they might change in future shiny releases. Instead, we'll leverage uh, HTML tools, render tags. Um, so that was just a note that the author mentioned earlier in uh, chapter five. Uh, let's see, this is running through an example. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at this example. Uh, going back to the previous example, why don't we just go for insert UI to save space? We encapsulated the dashboard UI inside a function that will be reused across some example. Um, I think for this case, um, Uh, so, so a brief overview um, of this example. Uh, if the item is inserted, the item counter as well as the dropdown text are not, uh, we may fix that by adding extra uh, insert UI and remove UI to replace those parts. Um, and in this example, order matters. Uh, so ensure that remove happens before insert um so there there are a couple issues to uh this example that they laid out in the book um there's a lot of server code uh can get can make the code complicated really quickly or or just a, a lot of it um and then setting priorities in observe event uh the author says it's a rather bad smell of poorly designed shiny app. Um, I think that's it, that's an interesting uh, way to put it. Um, 
like a lot of times you're not sure you can't explain why it's uh poorly designed or or whatever it's just a a bad smell to it so i i thought that was interesting um but for those reasons uh that's why uh the author shies away from from this case um yeah if you look at the ex if you look at at the example um where the author does use insert ui um let's see where is the actual call? there's yeah there's a lot of uh there's a lot of observe events happening um where we have to remove the old text counter and insert the new uh text counter uh insert message item uh there's a lot going on here with um with all of these observe events at once uh i it's, think it's difficult to work out what's going on isn't it really when because the, the, a lot of a lot of server code in in shiny you, you know there's no like obligation for the bit above to run before the bit below or anything like that when you know once the reactive graphs going on here you've got like observers and mm. you've got ui definition code and you've got like jquery type code in there it's all in the same place and it's like multiple different thought process is going on it's just regardless of whether it's efficient or not i, I just don't want to look at code like that you know um but yeah it's uh it's a uh, it's a very difficult like i i can't imagine how e how you could implement this easily using you know the tools that shiny provides you alone um but yeah, it's it, it's quite neat. But I really, I I just don't like that. There was I remember like in Clean Code or something where it mentioned mm -hmm. about how it's a, a kind of code smell to have two different languages in the same file. You know, if you've got your a big string defining a SQL query or something like that in otherwise a Java file or something. It, but here you've got you've you've got everything all in the space of one code block it's i don't know it's like r and css and um jquery and i don't know it's just not it, it's just quite hard to follow i'd have to draw a lot of diagrams to work if something went wrong with this code i'd have to draw diagrams out to work out what could be the possible reason for it um yeah it's a, difficult bit of stuff anyway sorry i didn't to, what i did mean to put in but uh, back to you <laughs> no no i'm i'm glad uh yeah that's that's definitely the code smell that uh that the author mentioned and like i don't know about like if if you handed this off to someone else it would be difficult for them to uh, interpret and and get a feel for what's going on like let alone your future self like to figure out what you're trying to do um uh so yeah definitely yeah the author notes uh so many of, of these functions for a simple action uh imagine if we had 10 similar tasks uh isn't there a way to do all this at once thereby reducing server code uh, more, moreover, setting priorities in observant is rather bad smell of a poor, uh, poorly designed shiny app. But I tell you, I didn't actually know what he meant in that sentence. What he meant by setting priorities, um, I, I can see that having so many observers and things is is quite a, a bad smell for what seems like quite a simple workflow. But um, yeah, I didn't know quite what he meant by priorities. Did he mean that like? where you're having to specify A must happen before B, which must happen before C. Yeah. Uh, that's the way that's the way I interpreted it, but I'm not uh 
yeah, that's that's why I I thought of it. Um, and all of that, uh, yeah, all of that to say, like the author really sets it up. Um, this whole chapter was about optimizing your app with custom handlers. And then like, we finally get to the punchline of uh, custom handlers in this final section. Um, let's see, I don't think I've had too many notes. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll just go over to the theory. Um, so Shiny provides tools to uh, ease the communication between R and JavaScript. Uh, we saw that in chapter 11. Um, so the author talks about the other important method, uh, session, uh, send custom message with type and message. Um, and it works by pairing with the JavaScript method, shiny.add custom message handler. Um, so here we have uh, here we have a, an R function with uh, text in the session, um, as well as as well as the JavaScript uh, code uh, defined, uh, where we have some custom alert. Um, so this. Excuse me. The final, the following Shiny app will simply print a message every five seconds. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just run this. Let's see. Uh, let's see what I've got here. I did this, I did this again. Oh, my R is not, not, not a fan of me today. I'm not sure if I did this example, if I ran this one before. Um, this seems to not be doing what it should be. Um, uh, regardless, uh, this is uh, this is kind of the picture summary of, of what's of what's actually happening on the on the back end um the the connection between the the r server and our uh, javascript client um uh, so this is uh triggered every uh five seconds with the invalidate later um with our custom message uh and I guess that gets uh, communicated via the WebSocket to JavaScript, um, where the the custom handler um, uh, is what gives us this uh, this custom message. Um, And I don't, I don't think I got this to run either because it didn't recognize the uh, Pokemon uh, depths function. I'm not sure if uh, anyone else was able to um, to get this working on their end. Um, but the gist of of this one is. Um, Uh, we have some get po Pokemon function. Uh, uh, it's a script which fetches uh, Pokemon data and if successful, sets an input value 
which will uh, subsequent, subsequently uh, will be subsequently available on the R side. Uh, so this is, yeah, this is a rather um, complicated, complex, uh, complex bit of code here <laughs> uh, that I didn't try to entirely understand, but I think I uh, got the gist of it. Um, so input uh, pokey da data is actually quite a compact complex list and some manipulation is done from R uh, in the observe event block. Once done, we send the data back to JavaScript through the web WebSocket. Um, and I think, I think that's like, it changes like, Uh, it changes the the background image. That's that's what that example does. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think this uh, four point two is probably what I wanted to go over. Uh, while we still had time. Um, and maybe I can introduce the chat uh, example and then leave that up to the reader, uh, as they say. Um, but if you remember from uh, the drop down, uh, BS4 dash drop down issue. Um, so we propose a method only involving custom message handlers. Um, instead of what we had before. Uh, so we create insert message item with two parameters, uh, item and session. Um, we give it a type that is add message item to be able to identify it from JavaScript with uh, the add custom message handler. Uh, some, some JavaScript stuff that uh, <laughs> that that takes the R stuff and, and displays it. Um, and then this solution significantly light, lightens the server code uh, since everything may be done on the JavaScript side in one step. Um, so yeah, quick over, quick overview of, of what's going on uh, with that. So we have our uh, insert dropdown item menu function with uh, the item in the session. And there, uh, there's the type as well. So JavaScript can um, identify it. Um, I believe this is the some drop JavaScript stuff <laughs> that takes takes that information. Um, let's see. So my understanding is like it, it defines the dropdown menu. It, it finds an item, um, adds it to a list or, or something. Um, converts it to HTML um, and then somehow adds it, uh, adds it to the, the list of items. Um, that's my like, poor, my poor understanding of, of what's going on here. I'm, I'm still very green with, with JavaScript. Um, uh, we also update the dropdown menu item counter as well as the icon text uh, since the dropdown menu is not re rendered. Uh, the number of items is given by the dropdown children. Uh, these two extra JavaScript, JavaScript steps save us from creating 
extra observe event on the server. Okay. We then recover the sent message on the JavaScript side with uh, the custom message handler, uh, parse the string to HTML, and then insert it after the header. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is this is showing we have the dependency on for the JavaScript uh, uh, code here, and then um, and then the then the menu here. So I think I have. We'll see if this runs. Hopefully. Cool. So that greatly reduces like the complexity of of uh, of what we had before. Um, yeah, it's significantly lightens the server code since everything may be done uh, on the JavaScript side in one step. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it is much nicer bit of code than um, the 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 equivalent server code that 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 was shown. And you, you know, less data is getting transferred from one place to another, and things like that. And you're not quite waiting on so many things. Um, yeah, the trouble is, it, it's it. I mean. Without this book, I, I genuinely wouldn't have known how to come up with a solution like that in this setting. Um, but yeah, it's... yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, I'm, I'm very impressed with the author and and uh, the amount of knowledge that that they have. Um. It's, it's humbling. Uh, <laughs> the the last so we have, we have just a few minutes left. Uh, the last part, um, I don't know if everyone got a chance to to look through the book. Um, uh, this chapter, I should say. Uh, but the author runs with that idea and creates like an entire chat system instead of just you know adding adding a message he he creates like a way to edit and delete uh and and add messages um so he goes through and and shows like um the html um uh what the interface looks like so you have uh, you have code for a way to like identify gray text for who's sending if someone's sending you a message and then uh, other text colors for different warnings or levels um, uh, so I won't get I won't get too um, involved in uh, in some of this. Um, so here you have you is this equivalent to a uh, to a chat thing where you'd have a single server and multiple people connected to that server who can you know if so if you open up 
a few different sessions of it, you can send messages from one browser screen to another. Is that how it actually, because I, did, I didn't actually run this example, um, but. Um, I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I opened up this admin LTE. Oh, here it is. Um, this is the chat. Uh, I thought I would. I thought I would be able to open the chat, but yeah. maybe, maybe not. Um. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure about that, Russ. Uh let me go back. Um so yeah, this this is quite the example. Um the author adds add, remove, and update um tools as well. Um, he notes that the difference in indexing with R and JavaScript that uh, you need to um, account for that. Um, let's see. There was one. Yeah, this this example goes <laughs> for quite a bit. The the one thing I also wanted to note. Oh, uh, when when he finally set this all up, uh, he said, don't forget to unbind, reinitialize and bind all inputs by successfully calling um, shiny.unbind all. Um, initialize inputs and shiny bind all. If you omit this part, the newly inserted input output elements won't work. Uh, Yeah, the the whole uh, the whole code can be found on the GitHub. Uh, so definitely suggest if you're interested to uh, to check it out and and check out that example. Um, but yeah, that that example was a lot. But hopefully, uh, hopefully um, you're able to learn something from from the rest of uh, today's chapter. Uh, glad I could go go through it with you all. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, that that final example was a little bit complicated. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the the whole idea that like, um, if you find your server code is taking up a lot of space for and and doing things that feel like they're really you could probably pass data around in someone's browser rather than having to pass it from the browser to the server and back. Um, yeah, could, considering how to do that in JavaScript may end up benefiting you and also like might end up trimming down your code and might improve your knowledge of the, the wider kind of world of app programming is, is quite a, Good lesson to learn but um yeah the the, the custom handlers are um quite cool so uh, so the in in the language of this chapter the handler is something that runs on it runs on the javascript side and responds to um messages that are sent by the the server i think or, or possibly, yes no that's right um in a similar way to how like an event handler might handle clicks and text input and things yeah i have a i know i know we're over time but i have a quick question um we could continue on slack is is it is it clear to anyone whether and 
you know, maybe if yes, like sort of broad brushstrokes, how one could utilize this within modules? Because, you know, in this example, you can kind of, you have the names of all of the elements and you can kind of hard code them in your JavaScript. But I'm thinking in modules, it might be problematic to, 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 to do this exchange because the modules might be called from from anywhere, right? Um, and and you won't know kind of like the, what the modules like prepended ID will 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 be. I mean, maybe you could work on classes or something like that. I I I don't know. Just uh, curious if anyone had thought about this, and if so, had any like broad ideas of how that might work together. Well, that you can you can namespace elements from you know within your server code and and typically when you uh, you know so like in in the user interface where you use ns which yep. either the capitalized form or the um um the um partialized form or whatever you'd call it um you can use you can use something similar in the server code so you can get I think it's session dollar NS will pull out the namespace of the module that you're working in. And um, you can get the kind of fully specified element ID using that if you need to send a, a, an element ID to the front end or to the, you know, to the UI code that you're using. Um, so, yeah, it, it is possible to disambiguate the um the identifiers from a a module um but the javascript the javascript side knows nothing of modules they're just like um dash separated strings as as part yeah. of the ids from from its perspective um but yeah you can construct those fully specified ids within the server side and, and and send them to JavaScript. If yeah, I was, I was thinking about the JavaScript side actually is, I mean, maybe you would refer to things that are less fragile than IDs and, you know, maybe mm, yeah. att attributes of the things. Uh, maybe that's the way to get around that, yeah. that issue. Cool. Anyway, thanks. Thanks for that. Oh, cool. right. Thanks, Trevin, for um, taking us through today's chapter. Um, I uh, will I'll meet again next week and we'll start talking uh start working through the next part of the book which is on uh a kind of prolonged example on uh bootstrap um and yeah so making a kind of bootstrap template for use in shiny app so it's a few four or five chapters on that um we'll meet next week and uh, i'll look forward to seeing you all again